This is our last chapter in this section that we started several days ago that described the judgment that's coming on Jerusalem. This is a prophecy. Uh, we're going to start a new section within Jeremiah next time. But this one is going to characterize the judgment that's coming. Um, it's going to be um, God's wrath. It's identified as God's wrath. It's imminent. There's no escape. And it's going to be horrible. So let's take a look at this in verses 1 through 4 of chapter 7. First, we see that it is God's wrath. Let's take a look. Let me read that for us. It says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, And you, son of man, thus says the Lord God to the land of Israel, An end, an end is coming and the four, to the four corners of the land. Now is the end upon you, and I will send my anger against you. I will judge you according to your ways and bring all your abominations upon you. God, again, like he did in chapter 6, is making it clear that he is the one that's bringing judgment and he will show no pity. It's clear that this is the covenant God of Israel. In your Bibles, sometimes you see the Lord uh, written out there and it's in lower case, uh, it's in lower caps. That means that behind that word is the word Yahweh, the name, the divine name of God, the holy name of God. Also, the covenant name it re, in a Hebrew reader uh, would uh, remind him that this is the God of the covenant that's speaking to his people, speaking to them through the prophet. Notice in verses three and four, as you read through this, the use of that term abomination. I've mentioned this a few times. Let me expand on it here. <clears throat> Abomination translates a Hebrew word, toeva. It's another one of those signature terms in Ezekiel. It's used 56 times in all the major prophets. 40 of those times are here in Ezekiel, it's, it, and it's used in two ways. One way it refers to ritual practices that disgust God, that is worship practices that disgust him. And then also to moral practices that disgust, God, uh, disgust him. Usually need, well, not usually, you always need to check the context to see if this is being used in a, in a moral way or in a ritual way. Here in these verses, it's used to encompass both. It says all abominations. So God is being comprehensive here. In the subsequent visions, in the next section, we're going to see abominations about their worship practices. In verses 5 through 9, we see that it's not only uh, that God's wrath is near. So in verses 1 through 4, it's presented as coming from God and breaking out from him in verses 5 through 9 it's presented as being near to them it's as good as we will say as already present it's irreversible uh, verse 5 said is it's coming verse 6 says again it's coming it has, has awakened God's wrath is stirred up it's awakened verse 7 says it has come. It's as good as here, in other words. And in verse 8, he says again, I will shortly pour out my wrath on you. So this is, this is inevitable. It's near. Verse 9 uh, combines these two signature phrases of Ezekiel, abomination, and then you will know I am the Lord. This is really uh, Ezekiel's message in one phrase in this first part of his book. The message is wrath is coming for your disgusting practices, proving beyond doubt that I am your Lord. Isn't that interesting? God doesn't abandon them to their sin. He doesn't turn away from their sin, but he punishes their sin, just as any good father will punish his children. Not abandon them, not kick them out of the house as children, uh, but he's going to punish them, to shape them, and mold them, and that's what God is doing here. So, verses 1 through 4 uh, makes it clear that this wrath is coming from God. It's His wrath. Verses 5 through 9, as you go through this, make it clear that it's imminent. It's about to happen. 
Verses 10 through 13 then say there is no escape. No escape. It's as um, inevitable as uh, grass growing after you plant grass seed. Uh, is inevitable as corn growing after you plant corn. They have sown seeds of arrogance and violence and they're going to blossom into wrath. They're going to reap what they've sown and there's no escape. And it's going to be for everyone. Both buyer and seller are going to reap. Buyer and seller just covers just about everyone. In verse 13, it says that both will die. Of course, we know that there's a remnant. And so this is speaking in generalities or hyperbole. We know that there's going to be a remnant. But the main message here, again, no escape from the judgment God is bringing on his people. And verses 14 through 27 close the chapter and close this section with a description of the horrors of judgment. Again, we look at these sometimes from our own perspective and we think, how could God do this? Well, God could do this because he's just and because his punishment always fits the crime. So if we take the image of the horrible judgments that are coming and look at it as if it was a mirror, what we're seeing is the reflection of the um, grief that God suffers for their abominations. The intensity that God views their sinning in is reflected in the judgment that he brings on them. So as we look through this horrors of judgment, we see in verse 14 that the soldiers are going to desert their duties. You know, that's a judgment from God when soldiers are no longer willing to defend their city or their country. That's a judgment from God that happens. Sorry. <laughs> Just have to put up with that for a second until it stops ringing. Verse 15 says there's no escape. Those inside the walls of Jerusalem will be cut down just as those outside that are in the field. Sorry about that. Verses 16 through 18, it says there's not um, only no escape, but there's no defense. Uh, they're going to be uh, paralyzed with fear, shaking so hard they won't be able to mount a, mount a defense for themselves. Verse 19, uh, their wealth is going to be worthless. Perhaps in light of what they're experiencing, they're not going to be able to buy their uh, safety, buy their escape. It's going to be um, not, uh, no one's going to take that bribe. Perhaps it'll be that the money has become worthless, that inflation has uh, happened, uh, spun so far out of control, that money becomes worthless. And we find the worthlessness of money is another way that God brings judgment on a people. Verses 20 and following talks about abominations, and these are ritual abominations. They brought, again, pagan idols right into the temple alongside the Holy of Holies. I've spoken about this before. Um, think about the Pantheon in Rome. If you've ever been to the Pantheon, it's a it's an enormous circular building. Uh, when you go into the building and look around the walls, there's niches built in each of the walls. And in ancient Rome, each of those niches contained a god or a goddess uh, that were worshipped in the Pantheon. Uh, today, they contain other sorts of uh, statues and idols. But uh, this is an example of bringing all these idols into a sanctuary. Think also of Acts 17, what Paul encountered on Mars Hill, which is uh, just a number of different idols set up on Mars Hill until Paul stumbled across an idol that they called to the unknown God. And Paul said to them, hey, this God that's unknown to you, this is the true God. So again, this what we would call today syncretistic worship, where we have blended together worship instead of a pure worship uh, of the God of the Bible. 
Verses 23 and 24 is this warning or this declaration, really, at this point, that they're going to be taken captive by the worst of the nations. And of course, God's speaking about Babylon here. Verses 25 and 26 is kind of the uh, penultimate uh, judgment. Again, God brings judgment to a nation. One of the ways he does that is by stripping away their leadership. So the spiritual and civil leadership of Jerusalem and Judah is going to be stripped away as judgment. So how do we apply this to ourselves, brothers and sisters? Well, God's judgment is inevitable. When we sin, God loves us too much to just let us continue in our sin. He loves us too much to allow us to continue to live as a child of Satan when we have committed ourselves to the Lord and Jesus has promised to keep us. So he'll bring chastisement against us. He'll bring conviction against us. It's inevitable. And we need to respond to that. We need to learn the lesson of Israel and not be stiff-necked, not be hard-hearted, not be hard-headed, but humble ourselves before the Lord and admit our sin and repent from it and receive the cleansing of the Holy Spirit, the cleansing that Christ has provided us through his blood. Receive that in a practical way and have that relationship, that uh, paternal fellowship with God restored to us through repentance. So God bless you, brothers and sisters. Next time into chapter 8, a new section, a new section full of visions of what's happening in Jerusalem.